You guys ready? Yes. Okay. So my name is Elizabeth Sweeney. I'm a postdoc at Rice. I just moved here two months ago, and I wanted to thank Ju for having me to come talk. He found me on Twitter, saw that I was moving here, and invited me to come talk to you guys. So very excited about checking out the group and see what's going on. Uh, this is my website. I do a lot on Twitter, so if anybody's on Twitter and wants to like connect on there, hit me up. And then that's my GitHub. All right. So what I'm going to be talking about today, how many people do neuroimaging analysis? Got one other person? Okay, how many, anybody interested in it slightly? A little bit? Okay, <laughs> great. <laughs> so it's pretty basic talk I'm going to give about how to work with structural MRI. So a lot of statisticians work with functional MRI. I'm a little bit unique in that way. I work with structural, and these are basically the images that are used in clinical practice to kind of um, diagnose disease and monitor disease progression. So I have a couple different structural MRIs from different diseases. This is brain cancer, multiple sclerosis, and stroke. These are all axial slices of the brain, so they've been cut through here. And uh, fMRI is something that you take over time. So every part, oh, that's much better, thank you. So every um, acquisition that you take has your brain over time. Uh, structural MRI has like a clearer picture of the brain. It's really high resolution, but you only get one or two images during an MRI session. So that's the data we'll be looking at. And so as like a statistician or an R user or a numbers person, you're going to ask, all right, there's a picture, but where do I get my data from? And so right here, I've blown up a little box in the image, and I've shown where the data from that comes from. So these are different pixels. The brighter areas have higher values for those pixels. Each pixel has just a number that tells what intensity it is. And the lower values have lower numbers. And so when you're dealing with this data, this is just one slice, but we actually have like a three-dimensional array that contains a bunch of different numbers that um, kind of make up this image. So we're, we're all familiar with two-dimensional pixels. Have you guys heard of three-dimensional voxels? All right, everybody's pretty hip in here. <laughs> All right, I can't, can't teach you anything. Uh, what are volume and volume? Yeah, so picture elements are pixels, oh. volume elements are voxels. So yeah, it's like the cooler pixel. <laughs> All right, and we can look at our brain a couple different ways. So I love axial slices, which are this way, but we can also do coronal, that's slicing the brain this way, or a sagittal. We can look at the brain from different angles. Um, and then something that they do when they take structural MRI, and a lot of my work revolves around this, is that we will look at the brain through kind of different lenses. So we'll take the MRI machine and we will kind of calibrate it differently to get different contrasts. And so this is all the same person's brain. This is a fluid attenuated inversion recovery or a flare volume, a T2 weighted, a proton density, and a T1 weighted volume. You could just think of it as looking at the same person's brain, but through like different glasses. And each one of these images kind of tells you something a little different about the disease. Uh, but that's typically what you're going to get out of a single structural MRI. It will just be these four images throughout the whole brain. OK. Um, so what I kind of specialize in like doing an R is image preprocessing. So this is like all the stuff you have to do before you can do fun statistical analyses. And like a lot of people ignore this part of like working with brain imaging data, but it's like the part I get really jazzed about. And it really opens a lot of doors because you can work with like the messiest data in the world and nobody else wants to touch it. So I, I like this. Uh, but basically when somebody gives you data off the scanner, it looks like this. So you'll notice um, all the images aren't in the same space and they're kind of acquired in different uh, planes. So I have some axial and some sagittal images. And so if I want to do some analyses and I want to like look at voxels in the brain and look at them across these different images, how would you do that with these? Couldn't, right? Or you could try, but it would be difficult. And so what you want to do is you want to put them all in the same space, like this. So now everybody's sagittally oriented, and this uh, voxel right here corresponds to that voxel corresponds to that voxel. And so that's kind of what I do, and I've worked with some other people to get this entire process done in R. And so I'm going to show you some of the packages that we use for that. So any questions so far? And interrupt me at any time. I don't like to talk that much. Yeah? Um, so I was working with Chipriyan Kranichanu at Johns Hopkins, um, but now I'm at Rice working with Geneva Allen. Mm -hmm. So I switched from biostat to stat. 
Okay, so let's first talk about the different R packages that we're going to be using. Uh, the first one is going to be, um, actually this is an outline of what I'm going to talk about. So the first thing is like the file format. There's these nifty files that we're going to talk about and this is how like the majority of imaging files are stored. Uh, then I'm going to show you this package FSLR that a good friend of mine made that allows us to do all the image preprocessing entirely in R. Um, and then there's a couple add-on R packages that I want to show you as well. I don't use them as much, but they might be very useful for something you want to do. And then I'm going to talk about some kind of post-processing analyses that I've been involved with and some of the R packages that that's produced. Okay, so NIFTIs are basically, did you guys see that link that I sent out on the Meetup page? Okay, so there's a link to my GitHub account. And there's a folder with a bunch of data in it. So there's a data folder and I've got a couple different brain images in there. And you'll see that everything has a .nii.gz uh, extension on it. And that's basically how these imaging files are stored. So they're nifty files. It's basically the way you typically use imaging data. It uh, can go across platform and it's just a three-dimensional array of the data and then it has a header that comes with it that tells you some information about the scanning when it was done what kind of acquisition was done and we'll take a look at that but everything's going to be in nifty uh, file format that we're using and so this package kind of made it possible to do anything in R with these files because you can't really read them in without this so this is oro.nifty it allows you to write read and do all kinds of things with these nifty files and what it does is it can read these in and then it creates nifty R objects. And these are S4 classes or S4 objects. And then you can kind of work with those in R and then it writes out nifty files as well. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and get an R session going and we're gonna start working with some of this data and you guys have all the code if you wanna follow along. Although there's some stuff you had to install and I didn't say that beforehand. Uh, and it, it doesn't go that fast. And then all the data I'm using is from here. Uh, it's the Kirby 21. So it's this really cool study. I think it's from Hopkins where they had 21 subjects. They're healthy, but they came in one day and they got a scan at the beginning of the day. Then they waited a few hours and scanned them later. So it's a reproducibility study to see how much the scanner changes throughout the day. So very cool study and a lot of people do analysis with that. Zero. Yeah. So that's a, that's a good question. So a lot of people look at brain activity, and that's assessed through fMRI and other types of functional modalities. This is complete structure. So the kind of... What'd you say? Yeah, structure changes, but you're not going to see those in one scan. So I do a lot of like longitudinal studies where I'll follow like subjects for 10 years. Then I might see some changes. And you're not, I hope you won't see any changes in the Kirby 21 data. It's someone's brain structure within like five hours. Or they're like really not doing too hot. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so let's get started in R. Can you guys see or uh, kind of see? Yeah. Okay, more or less. All right, so the first thing I'm going to do is go ahead and load in the oro.nifty package. It was the one I was talking about. And so I've set my working directory to that data file that I provided everybody. And so the first thing we could do is we can read in nifty files. So this is read nifty. It's from the oro.nifty package. And all you need to do is say the name of the image. And then this reorient command tells you to kind of put the images into a standard space when you read them in. So if you don't do this, they can all be like turned different ways. This will look at the header information and orient them correctly. So you always want to do reorient equals true. All right, so we'll read this in. Takes a second, they're kind of big. Um, and so if we look at the dimension of this, this is 170 by 256 by 256 dimensional array. So that's one, one brain image. And if we explore the object a little bit, it's an S4 object. The type is nifty, it's float data. Uh, these are things that it's pulled out of the header about the scanning acquisition. So one of the things that I use all the time is this pixel dimension. And I actually don't like this because it's not a pixel, right? It's a 
a voxel. <laughs> You've been paying attention. Um, so that's the dimension of the voxels. And so these are not isotropic. These particular voxels um, have, they're one by one by 1.2 millimeters. And so that might be something you want to keep in mind when you're doing your analysis. If you want to calculate volumes of things, they aren't all the same, you know, the uh, X direction is larger. So that's really important. And then it tells you the voxel units. And time is, uh, NIFTIs can be used for fMRI as well. So the time would tell you the seconds or whatever for an fMRI. So there's a lot of good stuff in here. And you can look at the slot names, um, kind of the same thing, but this dot data is where that array is. That will be what you're most interested in. So any question about the NIFTI objects? Yeah, no, it's from this library. Okay. Yeah. Slot name is based. Oh, the function is from is base, but okay. slot names are from oh, those yeah, particular right, things. Right. Yeah. From the object. Right. Yeah. Okay. Slot name is just it just tells you what are the names of the elements of the X four But why does it use names? Because names doesn't work on X four. Oh. Yeah, it's spe specific for this. But yeah, slot names is methods. X four has slots. Yeah. But um, yeah, I'm not that familiar with like what S4 is exactly. I just know that this happens to be S4. I'm not an expert on that. And I just I like the nifty objects because like I can use them together and kind of play with them and I know how they work. But I'm not an expert on S4 at all. Okay, so you might want to look at the images, right? Like we want to see what they look like in R. So you can use the image command, but this is going to give you kind of an ugly image. Do you guys like that? Yeah? <laughs> um, well, I don't like it for a couple of reasons. Number one, the aspect ratio. It just like made the person's head like kind of crazy small. And I don't like the color, but you can change colors and you can change. So what I did is I did image. Uh, this is the name of my image. Mpure age is a type of key one. And I selected which axis I wanted and which slice from that axis. So I went the 128th slice in the z-axis and plotted that. And I could do it in um, the coronal slice, and I experimented with colors. <laughs> eh, it doesn't look too good. Or you can also do it in the sagittal slice. But the way that I normally look at these is using the orthographic function from uh, oro.nifty. So that's right here. Takes a little bit. But that one looks a lot nicer, right? that has all of the different views, and that's almost a publication-ready figure, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, and you can also change, you see these crosshairs right here? They're at the center of the image at this point, but you can control where those crosshairs are. So you can say X, Y, Z will put those crosshairs and select which um, slices you're going to be looking at. So you can use orthographic to do that. Did I do that? Yeah, and this is kind of a poor choice because the axial one, I picked slice 15, and that's like way down. This is the bottom of somebody's head. Uh, but yeah, so you can kind of play around with that. There's a lot of freedom in what you can look at and those types of things. So that's kind of how you make figures using this package. Any questions on the visualization? Yeah. Uh-huh. So has anybody um, looked up that Yeah. So um, we've actually, my group's made a couple of shiny apps, but as you said, they're super slow. So we started using like Papaya libraries, okay. and there's something we call like Papaya, <laughs> and like there's a package. I don't know if it's on CRAN or on GitHub, but it it doesn't make these kind of figures yeah. like the coronal axial and such but it will open the image in whatever direction you want and you can scroll through it actually actively awesome. yeah and i think uh the shiny app just wasn't really viable cuz it's so slow right it, it's yeah really slow, but i i wonder like i I'm, I'm imagine you're going to get into analysis then and like yeah you know, like To do that, yeah. 
Yeah, no, it's true. But I actually want, so I like the papaya because sometimes I just want to look at the brain and be like, well, what's going on? Like something silly will come up in my analysis and I'll be like, why is this happening? And I'll realize there's this huge motion artifact or, you know, if I go through the slices, I can find what's happening. So I like like instantaneously being able to go through them. Yeah, I think you could. Yeah, if you just had three of them going, that'd be very cool. I should try that. Yeah, that's a really good idea. Yeah, and I think that's a better idea. Like, I like that more than a shiny app because you can, like, get it real time. Yeah, we'll have to do that. Yeah, because like you were saying, you just you go to the refrigerator when your thing's plotting and then you forgot what you were doing. <laughs> and then you miss the world's greatest discovery. <laughs> Uh, any other questions about the visualization? But yeah, I use these all the time in papers. So I think it's like, I mean, image was so ugly, right? You, I guess you could try and publish that, but it didn't look too good. <laughs> I've seen people do it. But this is like a really great way to make publication-ready figures when you're doing neuroimaging stuff. Are, are you able to adjust the contrast or Okay, so that's super hard. Um, so the way that I have to do it is kind of hacky. Like I can sometimes adjust the contrast by adding in like a value that's really high or something. Like I'll make like one pop voxel like have a value of 200 and that'll kind of adjust it or like things like that. But there isn't really a great way to adjust the contrast. And so that's something that I think would be, yeah, like, and I, I think it's actually really easy to adjust the contrast because it would just be like a transformation function, but it's not implemented yet. And that's something that I would I would like to see. Yeah, because like this bottom slice, right? That looks bad, and you might want to adjust the contrast on that so you could actually see what's going on down there. Yeah. All right, um, so you can also calculate like statistics on these nifty objects. Um, I calculated the mean of this image is like 14 or 143,000. Uh, something interesting about MRI objects is they don't, or MRIs in general, they don't have units. So that's kind of one of the difficulties of working with these. So I said add something like 1,000, because sometimes I work with these and the values are like 100 to 200, but today it's like 140,000. So it changes. But yeah, you can calculate all kinds of different stats on it. You can make histograms of like the intensities in there. A lot of zeros because there's background, but we're going to remove the background in a second. Um, and then, okay, so I'm going to switch back to the other slides and then we're going to get into the image pre-processing stuff. Um, there we go. Okay, so the main uh, tool that I use for doing image pre-processing is FSLR. So FSL is, has anybody ever worked with FSL? Yeah, I, I figured. <laughs> the only other person who does neuroimaging, but it's like the most common neuroimaging software suite. And, uh, but normally you have to run it in Bash and people who use R or don't know Bash might not be able to do that. I wrote this like one method one time where I was switching between FSL and R and I had to like iterate between the two like eight or nine times. It was the ugliest piece of code. I'm so embarrassed. I finally like changed it and made it with FSLR. So it's like all in one thing. But it's really useful to have it when you need it for your analysis. You want it all in one platform and you want just a nice, nice looking code. Uh, so this is a link to FSL if you click on here. And this is to FSLR. Oh, and I'm, I'm sorry. I guess we've kind of not done much for Windows today. Uh, you cannot use FSL on Windows. Uh, I did some stuff with like a virtual box on Windows, um, and if anybody wants to use that, I can. You can talk to me about it. But you really can't use FSL on Windows. But it's their fault, not not mine. <laughs> okay, uh, this is my good friend from my PhD, John Michelli. He made this whole FSLR package. I've been involved in some of the documentation and that, and I use it all the time. But he's really the guy who like did this whole thing, so check him out on Twitter, he has a really cool blog. Okay, so how you would set up FSLR? You have to download FSL first, so uh, there's a link for doing that. Then you just get this R package FSLR, and then you just use this options command to set the path to where FSL is on your machine. It'll probably be in the applications folder. And that's all you need to do to get started using FSLR. 
Any questions about that? Yes, and I'm actually going to go through a chunk of code. It's just system calls. Yeah. And it pushes it back and forth, and it can write it to disk if you don't want to read it back into R. But it's, it's, yeah, it's very simple. But it's really changed a lot of things for us for just kind of making things more streamlined. I never was able to figure that out. Like, it's not really clear on the uh, web page. Does anybody know? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I actually spent like 40 minutes one day trying to figure it out. Um, but I, it's this like group, I think it's in Oxford or Cambridge, big uh, neuromagic group. That's what it is? FMRI B oh, software it's library. Oh. <laughs> I think I saw that and I was like, that can't be what it stands for. Oh. Oh. I looked on their website like a whole bunch. I was like, well, are they going to like introduce it? <laughs> yeah. But, okay, so it's the fMRI B software library. <laughs> yeah. I feel bad that it took me, I looked for like a half hour and you found it in 20 seconds. <laughs> All right, but here's an example of what the functions are doing. So uh, this particular command will do skull stripping. We'll just take the skull off of a person's head because you might not want that for your analysis. And um, we can kind of see what it's doing. So the first thing it's doing is it's deciding to use bet1 or bet2. That's the name of the... Um, the software or the call that you use in Bash to call this uh, skull stripping. So it decides, did you say bet two or bet uh, original? So it's just two different variants of the skull stripping. Then it does command get FSL, that just gives it the path to where FSL is. Then command right here, paste together a couple things from your input as well as where FSL is to create the command that we want to send to FSL. And then this thing in pink right here is really what's happening. And it's just a system command. And so it's sending that to FSL. Um, and then if we want to return the image, then it basically writes the image to a file first, and then it reads it back in and will um, return it within R. So any questions on that? I don't, did I explain it out OK? No, so um, the default is it just writes an NII file wherever you tell it to, wherever out file is. But if you say ret image equals true, it'll just return it as a nifty object in R. So it'll return it as the output of that command. But you can run these and do the whole analysis and not have things pushed back into R. And there's some reasons you might want to do that. If you don't, I mean, it takes a lot of time to read these in and out, or you just might be interested in making the images and not looking at them in R. But I, I actually always do ret image equals true. But yeah. But yeah, so just system commands. That's all that's happening with this. Um, any questions on that? Great. OK. So let's go ahead and use FSLR. Okay, so I've got library FSLR, and I'm going to, remember we have to set the FSL path. I'm going to do that in a second, because I just want to use, oh, I wanted to read this in first. So this is, I'm first going to read in a follow-up image. So remember I was saying this is a reproducibility study, where I had uh, a subject going, getting scanned, and then coming back a couple hours later and getting scanned again, but it's the same subject. So I just want to look at both of those side by side and see what's going on. So FSLR has this nice function called double ortho, which allows us to look in the orthographic view at two subjects side by side. And this is actually the same subject, but at two different time points. So that's kind of fun. And you can see that they aren't lined up exactly correctly, right? Like I looked down here and I could see this area and this area. You know, you can tell they just aren't in the same space at this point in time. And a better way to look at that is I could difference the images. 
and this is still a nifty object. So you can do like things like add images together, subtract them, multiply them, do all kinds of crazy stuff, and they stay as nifty objects. And then I can look at this. And you can see when I subtract the two images from each other, if they were aligned in space perfectly, you'd expect to see nothing, right? They would just vanish. But you see a lot of what I call the yin-yang effect, where they aren't quite aligned on top of each other properly. OK, so the next thing we can do is we can go ahead and do some analysis. And so my goal today is to take that image from the follow-up study and move it to the baseline study. So that's one goal. And I just want to pull the skull off of the baseline study. So those are just two, two simple things to do. OK, so we set this option. So my FSL is in my application folder. Uh, one thing that you want to do with these images when you're working with them is bias field correct them. So when images are acquired in a scanner, uh, depending on like how close you are to the sensors, different tissue can kind of take different values depending on where it is spatially in the brain. So if I have a white matter voxel right here and a white matter voxel down here, they might take different values even though they're the same like tissue composition. And that's not good, right? That's like an artifact of the machinery that we're using. And so this is an algorithm that uh, removes that and it's like the first step you want to do whenever you're working with uh, MRI data. Uh, but it takes like 10 minutes, so I didn't want to show you that. <laughs> uh, so I did it at home. Um, and then one thing, if you're doing this in our studio, our studio like will disconnect. It won't. Our studio seems to like disconnect if you run something with a system command that takes too long, and then it won't let it come back. So I normally just run this in R. Uh, has anybody run into problems like that? Yeah. What'd you say? Yeah, it hangs. Did, have you come up with a solution, or are you just? No. Yeah, even I, especially if you're using Wi-Fi phone, that we, uh, what would you recommend that we not use? Our studio? Our studio. Yeah, so I typically do, well, I don't use our studio to do the image processing because that happens, but it's better to show people in our studio. Uh, so if that starts happening to you, you know what's up. So I'm just going to read this in. But is there, does anybody know if you, can you fix that or it's just not a, I find oh, it annoying. Yeah. Okay. No, yeah. But it works better? Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, if you just want to like create a child process, yeah, and then like have that return when it's done. Yeah, like, yeah. Or you can, yeah, exactly. So or command tab K will yeah, will yeah. take care of that. Yeah. Let R like um, take control back of the Yeah, yeah. No, I think there's lots of like ways I can get around it. I Bob Rossed it and like did it at home, and then we'll just show it to you. <laughs> But you can run this code and don't run it in our studio. <laughs> okay, so I did the bias correction, which you guys can use this code right here. It's just FSL underscore bias correct. And I'm just going to read it in, or I already did read it in while you guys weren't paying, or while we were discussing this. So I have MPRH base bias corrected. So I'm just going to show you the difference between those two objects. So I'm going to subtract them, and then I'm going to look at the difference between those. So this is the one that's been had the bias removed minus the one that the original image. So you can see there's these spatial Z varying fields that we've kind of taken out of the images. And so it's actually doing something. And this I did like an entire analysis one time where the bias correct wasn't done properly, messes everything up, especially if it's intensity based, which this happened to be. So this is like a really important step for image analysis. Okay, and in like the subsequent steps, like the skull stripping I'm about to do, depend on doing this well. So the next thing I'm going to do is remove the skull. So this, I'm going to use the command FSL bet. 
which we had looked at before, and I'm going to reorient the image. And we can see it's kind of working right here. So there's a little bit of output, tells us where the FSL directory is, kind of tells us what it's doing. Um, and then I had set the FSL output to nii.gz, and they go ahead and they do that for me. But now, um, so now what I've done is I've assigned the output from FSL bet to this MPRH base bias corrected stripped. And so we can take a look at this. So I'm going to double ortho and look at the original image and the bias, corre the bias corrected and skull stripped one. Yeah, this, this function takes a minute. <laughs> the, the orthos and the double orthos. But now you can see on the left I have the image with the skull on, and on the right I've used the algorithms from FSL to remove the skull. And I think it, it's done an okay job. Um, this is a better way to look at it. So I'm going to create a brain mask, and I'm basically just going to take this image and assign anywhere that there are zeros um, to an NA so I can overlay it on top of the other images. So basically, I'll take this image right here. Anywhere that's greater than zero, I'll assign that a value of one. And anywhere where it's zero, I'll assign it a value of an NA. An orthographic takes anything that has values, and it will overlay it on top of the image. And anything that's NA, it'll leave as clear. So we'll see that. You can kind of see this brain mask isn't as great as you might have thought it was. kind of looks like Cookie Monster came and like <laughs> ate on the side. So FSL doesn't always do the best job at skull stripping. But now, so these are the values I assigned one in the brain mask and the NAs are the other things. And I've just plotted that as an overlay on top of my other image. And you just do that by using orthographic, your original image, and this um, is like a Y equals or just a second argument will be the overlay. Okay, um, and th so you can also do histograms over just the areas of the brain that have actual meaning, not the background. So I'm going to do a histogram over the image where the mask is equal to one. And so that might tell you a little more than that previous histogram that was like really overtaken by zeros. And we can write things. So write nifty is the function that you can use to write things back as .nii.gz files. So I'll do write nifty. This is the object I want to write. This is the file name. So I'm calling, I'm going to write the brain mask, the bet mask, and I'm going to call it brain mask, and it will tack on the nii.gz for me. Uh, verbose just like makes it print something, and then gzipped true. You kind of want to leave it that way because these are pretty big and you want to zip them up. <laughs> and so that just takes a second. and. Yeah, so now that'll be in the folder that we're working in. Okay, the next thing I'm going to do is do registration. So I'm going to take my follow-up image and move it to the space where my baseline image is. So the name of the algorithm in FSL that does that is called FLIRT. I don't know what it stands for. Maybe Sahil could tell me because he's very good at finding these algorithms, <laughs> uh, initials that I can't find. But you basically do FLIRT. You take the image you want to move. You take your target image. And then the degrees of freedom just tells you what type of transformation you want to do. So I'm going to do a rigid transformation, which is just roll, pitch, and yaw. So you can kind of move the object around, but you don't allow it to enlarge or you don't allow shearing uh, because it's the same person's brain, right? So you wouldn't expect you and then you two hours later to need to like enlarge your head, right? To like match up together. You expect that you've just kind of moved in the scanner slightly, but you don't expect that you're your head's gotten bigger, or you need like a nonlinear transformation to get to that. So, degrees. Linear registration tool. Probably fMRI V linear. <laughs> yeah, that's the nonlinear one. Yeah. <laughs> Finert and and then there's a. So I found out you can't finert before you flirt. Because you need to do the affine registration <laughs> first, and I like I like that. Uh, <laughs> it's a terrible thing. But <laughs> yeah, but yeah. So you can go ahead and you can run this, and then uh, you were talking about Finert, which is the nonlinear one. So that's like something that's really flexible, and I would only use that if I was like registering two different subjects who weren't the same. We always want to use the flirt command first and do the affine transformation 
because Veneur doesn't have that written in. Okay, so this is going ahead and it's working. Um, quick question. So when you were doing that bias test, that was a test, right? The bias test that you mm -hmm. uh, you always say return every group in that test? Yeah, because I want to do all the subsequent but things. Then, but then you said if you just say return in its false, why did you apply it and then sub when it finishes, just read it back, read back the first, back the first. Because what what yeah. happened, Yeah, but then do you think it would, I wonder if it would still lose the connection. I need to experiment with that. But I, I wonder if, because it's gone for so long, even if it's like expecting or not expecting to get something back, will you still lose the connection to R? How long does the bias test take? 10, maybe 15 minutes. Yeah. I'll give that a try then, yeah. Um, but yeah, so now I've got this follow-up image registered, and I'm going to do that subtraction I did before and prove that this looks better. <laughs> so now I'm going to use double ortho, and I'm going to show the difference that we had before when it looked all crazy, and then this really nice difference. You really know how long something takes when you have to like sit up in front of people and do it. <laughs> But you can see, so on the left side, can you guys see that okay? That's the one that had the yin-yangs. On the right side, you see it's not perfect, but after the registration, things really line up and you don't really see any anatomical differences in the subtraction. So I'm pretty happy with the stuff on the right. And then do I, okay. So that's about it for the R code. I have a couple more slides with some more resources, but any questions about FSLR? Yeah, and like I think there's enough. Uh huh. Can you open your calculations on the image? Yeah, so um, you can definitely. So I wouldn't overlay because the parcellation is more of an fMRI. Okay, so if you did an fMRI analysis, you had the parcellations. Definitely overlay them with the Y thing. So do you remember when we did the brain image mm -hmm. or the brain mask and we said Y equals? So if you do orthographic, your image. And then Y is your parcellations. And if you have a couple different parcellations and you assign them different numbers, you could make them different colors on here. So I do know a lot of people use it for that type of thing. So it works for both. And you can overlay like statistical maps too that have like, you know, whatever, C-statistics or SI statistics or whatever. Yeah. And mm -hmm. the same shape of the same matrix, you overlay that. Yeah, as long as they're the same dimension and you can you could have a continuous value and you can get like a little color bar and do you do so this is you just showed us the pre processing, but do you do your statistics in R as well mm -hmm. on the matrices directly? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So I do all my analysis in R. Um, I do I actually I don't always do my image pre processing in R because I I came before the package and I like have a system that I use. Uh, but it's been really great for like teaching other people how to do it. And it's I, it's a better way to do it than how I do it. I'm just old and stuck in my ways. <laughs> um, okay, so let's. Okay, so there's a couple other like alternatives to FSLR. There's ANTS R, uh, and this isn't actually a system call thing. This is. The people who made this ANTS, which is another popular neuroimaging software, I think it's Advanced Normalization Tools is what it's called. Um, and it does almost all the same things FSLR does, but they wrote a bunch of things in C and like use R and like it's all there together. Uh, and that works really well. Uh, that's on GitHub right now, so you can use the DevTools package and pull that off Git GitHub. Um, one thing though, you need to have CMake installed on your machine. And you need to use this library CMaker. You have to install that before you install the ANSAR and then ITKR and have both of those open and ready to go when you install ANSAR. And this is like, this package messes up almost every time I try to install it. It's notorious for like being Yeah. Installed. <laughs> they always promise that it's going to be so much better than everything else and that nobody can install it. But it is though. Like the two or three times I got it to work, it's yeah. like, 
I mean, it's so much better, but the brain it's track for example is way better. Yeah, the brain is like notoriously like hard in pre processing brain to just you know, trying to get just the brain tissue out without having to manually spend hours going and like And you saw how bad my brain mask was, right? It had like the cookie like these weird like bite marks yeah. coming out of it. And I've had some where there's like a huge like half the brain's missing. I'm just like, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah, and this one works. Like competing algorithms for just that step. Yeah. So like the best, the brain extraction tool, I think Rebecca Bell has one. And then but I can't use the brain because this one's an atlas-based thing, and it does like I've never been able to use it yeah. through R. So uh, supposedly there's this great brain extraction tool. Well, why can't you not like? Okay, we well, can't. You can already install it. It's just installing. It's like getting it, getting all the tools. To Yeah. Oh, that's smart. Yeah. Yeah. But this dude is like. Yeah. The and um, I know John was making Docker's of some of these things, so he's he's on. I don't know if he's done that yet. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, but the problem. Yeah, but then he updates it all the time. Like, this dude's always working on it, this Brian Avance guy. So then he'll be like, I put this, this, and this in. And he'll be like, I gotta have the new one. And then you'll be like, oh, there goes Saturday. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. It's a pretty cool idea. Yeah. I always give it like 20, you know, I'll work on this for 15 hours, and yeah. then if I can't, like eventually you have to have results, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I, I'll, what were you doing, Elizabeth? Oh, you know, just trying to install this package <laughs> for <laughs> two days. <laughs> Take the brains yeah. out. Yeah. 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 Or I always get people will sit next to me on an airplane and I'll be working on it and they'll be like, ew. Yeah. <laughs> what are you doing? And I'll be like, oh, guess this is weird. <laughs> yeah. And I, ha I often work on animal brains too. So I'll have like animals or, and it might not even be brains. It'll be like other parts. And I'm just sitting there working on it and people are like, you're so strange. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so. Yeah, so what does yeah, they have to do with Oh, they have them? With yeah. ants? Yeah. Okay. Like, yeah, I have no clue what these mean, but I'm just going to. E F N I D T K. Afne is a different um, software. Oh, yeah. You basically get into dependency hell when you try to install Yeah. No, it's just all there. That's awesome. Huh. That's worth looking into. But yeah, Yeah, I like that. I wish they'd make one for Ansar. Yes. They have one for Ansar? Not Ansar, Ansar. Okay. No, not really, because like Ansar doesn't, it's not like a system call thing. Like it's a whole different thing. You don't actually install Ansar. It's yeah, that's the weird thing. It should actually have like the API that lets you call an install version of Ansar. Yeah. 
They might. Maybe they have it, but I've always done it this way. I don't want to speak for it. Um, but anyways, this is terrible. I mean, but so I did this project with a bunch of nonlinear registrations, and the ones for this were just beautiful, and the ones for FSL were so terrible. And like, but so it's totally worth it if you can get it to work. If you're very serious about doing something right, this is the way to go. But you just, I think you can email the guy sometimes. I do that every once in a while, and I'm like, I can't get this to work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah it, it's, it's a pain. Okay, a couple other packages you might want to know about. Oro.dicom is the one for, I was talking about nifty file format, but a lot of times things right off the scanner will be DICOM format. And this package just basically converts DICOMs to nifties. And then you can use the rest of the things. So it's a very important one. Um, and then John uh, Michelli, the guy I was talking about, made this extra ANSAR, which is just like helper functions for ANTS. That, because ANTS decided to make their very own uh, ANTS objects, and they don't play well with the other neuroimaging software. So you have to convert the ANTS objects to nifty objects to use them, and then if you have nifty objects, you need to convert them to ANTS objects to do ANTS commands with them. So this has all the, the little helpers you need. Um, so a couple of things I've worked on are intensity normalization. You remember I was telling you guys that when you scan somebody, the different voxels could take, there's no units on these. So this is a plot of the flare, the T2, and the T1 from three different subjects. I've just taken the voxels and plotted them. This is one subject, this is another, and this is a third. And the purple is just like a region of interest, and the red is something else. But you can see these subjects are not in the same space, right? The voxel intensities aren't comparable. But there's intensity normalization packages that we've developed that these are all those same three subjects after the normalization. So it puts them all in the same space, and you can do population level modeling. And so that's a big first step that like a lot of people who are new to the field don't like see that nuance right away. And so there's two packages right here. There's white stripe and Ravel, and they're just two different ways of doing that normalization. And then I worked a lot on MS lesion segmentation. So here I have a brain from a person who has MS. It's an axial slice. And those white areas right there are MS lesions. And so I developed algorithms to automatically find those lesions. I guess this is like super specific. You have to be working on MS to use these packages. But I've got two packages right here, Oasis and Sublime. And they rely really heavily on that FSLR package. So um, they're kind of fun things and kind of end products that you can use. So you can find the lesions in somebody's brain using these algorithms. Um, and so if you want to learn more about this, this was just kind of like a really quick uh, intro. I have a Coursera class that my advisor from Hopkins and I made along with John Michelli. Um, and so I think that's running now. I think you can jump in at any time. I don't quite get Coursera, even mm -hmm. though I'm <laughs> like, I don't get when you can sign up and everything. Um, but yeah, so I think you can sign up now. If not, in like a couple of weeks, we're starting a new class. So check it out. And there's tons of data in that class and like, details on like what the best steps are for processing this data and how to use these packages. All right, that's all I got. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Which one? Oh, for the red image? Yeah, um, so for a while I wasn't using it because it wasn't working properly, but then Oro.nifty uh, like got, got their act together and started like the reorientation actually is useful now. So I was using some old code and had it as false. So we used to like put everything like in crazy spaces and I would just be like, this is like ruining everything. But now it's pretty good. But that's one thing you really want to watch when you're doing these analyses. Like, Sometimes the header on your image is messed up and you might be reading in half your images like one way and half the other way. And then you're like adding them together and you're getting crazy stuff that if you don't look at what you're doing, it can get out of hand. So I would say red image equals true, uh, but it was false last night because I forgot to update because the package got better. Any other questions? No, um, so I work with the entire brain. So normally I'll do these analyses on like 100 or 200 subjects. And um, 
So the lesion segmentations are the voxel wise, but I do some smoothing things to kind of take in neighborhood information. And then I've done some work on kind of modeling the correlation structure within the brain um, and like trying to model it on other things. But it's difficult. So some of it is like univariate analysis and then some hacky ways to put it all together. And I'm trying to get it like kind of spatial. Uh, so these problems right here are prediction problems. Right? So multiple testing is more of an inference type thing. So when you're doing um, fMRI analysis and you want to see which voxels are activating, you're running like a billion, not a billion, a million like tests at all the voxels in the brain. So those are statistical tests for inference and you do need to do them multiple comparison correction. When doing MS lesion segmentation, I'm just trying to find the lesion. So my metrics are more like um, doing receiver operator greater characteristic curves, so static similarity coefficients. So it's like, I love prediction for that, because you can do really a lot of like, you don't have to think about, so that, that, that's a new problem right there, the multiple comparison correction. Any other questions? Cool. Thank you guys, it was fun.